The year was 1962, and General Douglas MacArthur was by then an old man. He had been one of the greatest military heroes of all time, leading our armies in World War I and II in Korea. But now the shadows were lengthening in the twilight of his life. MacArthur had returned to his beloved West Point, where he had been a cadet some 60 years before. He had come to say goodbye. His moving speech that day on the plane was entitled, Duty, Honor, Country. And he ended with these reflective thoughts. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, I come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echoes, duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last conscious thoughts will be of the Corps and the Corps and the Corps. I bid you farewell. General Douglas MacArthur died less than two years later on April 5th, 1964. And it seems fitting that we who enjoy the sweet benefits of freedom honor him and all those soldiers, sailors, and airmen who died in the defense of duty, honor, country. Hello, dear listeners. I'm James Dobson, host of Family Talk, and we're on a mission today. I want to read my June letter to you, which this particular month is something that I am absolutely passionate about. I've been at this broadcast thing for more than 42 years, and during that time I've written over 400 monthly letters. These are not casual messages to our friends. I sometimes spend up to 40 hours researching and writing a particular letter. They're not what other ministries call fundraising letters, but I don't say much about it, although I occasionally take a paragraph or two to remind people of how we're supported. But the primary purpose is to write something extremely important at that particular time about the family, about the defense of righteousness, and about the country. If you're not on our mailing list, all you have to do is drop us a line and you can receive that uh, letter every month. With that, let me share um, the heart and soul of what I'm coming to you with today and you'll see why it's important to me. Let's go. Dear friends, in October 2010, Shirley and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary by taking a long overdue trip to Europe. After visiting London and Paris for a few days, we boarded a train for Normandy, France, where a massive military invasion had occurred on June 6, 1944. Visiting that hallowed place was one of the most emotional experiences of our lives. This month, June 6, 2019, marks the 75th anniversary of that life and death struggle known as D-Day. My letter this month is dedicated to the memories of the men who fought and died there in defense of liberty. The bloody battle to liberate Europe by defeating Nazi Germany took place on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of the Normandy coast. The designated sites were codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. Combined, 156,000 troops were deployed, utilizing 6,900 ships and landing craft, 36,000 vehicles, and 11,600 planes. There has never been anything quite like that in world history. Freedom and tyranny hung in the balance for millions of people on that day, and the outcome was anything but certain. An Allied defeat could have prolonged World War II indefinitely and might have even changed the eventual outcome. Supreme Allied Commander, U.S. Army General Dwight David Eisenhower, knew that enormous loss of life was likely. He spoke briefly to some of his troops as they prepared to board ships and planes headed for France. I've seen a film of that conversation of those words from the general, and this is a portion of what he said on that stormy morning. Quote, 
you're about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. And let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. I was eight years of age when all this took place, and I remember it emphatically. Eisenhower then drafted a message for later release to the press if the Allied forces had been pinned down on the beach and driven back into the sea. The general must have been heavy of heart as he considered the unthinkable. He wrote on that day, Our landings in the Cherbourg Hav area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and this place was based on the best information available. The troops and airmen and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Once victory was assured, Eisenhower crumpled that draft statement and threw it in the trash. His assistant later found the crumpled note and preserved it for posterity. Thank God the news proclaiming victory was the only message required. President Franklin Roosevelt was monitoring the progress of the battle from the White House in Washington, D.C. God-fearing people across the nation held their breath as news of the invasion was made public. Roosevelt was reported to be a praying man, and Americans heard him speak to God on a nationwide radio broadcast. Here are excerpts of that prayer spoken on that fateful morning. I can tell you I can still hear his voice, and the entire nation was listening. He said, In this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic and our religion and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard, for the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again and we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sore tried by night and by day without rest until the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violence of war. Some will never return Embrace this, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of the brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, Almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in the renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of the enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogance. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just reward of their honest toil. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Those are the words of Franklin Roosevelt. The historic clash between two armies began about 6 a.m. The Germans looked out of their bunkers on a foggy morning 
and were shocked to see an enormous armada steaming toward them. It must have been a terrifying sight. Some of the combatants were mere boys. Soon landing craft, known as Higgins boats, began unloading many thousands of Allied troops who were jumping into the surging English Channel. Each man carried up to a hundred pounds of gear and many drowned when they hit the water. Most of the amphibious tanks that were designed to float quickly sank and carried their crews to a watery grave. Fighting was the most intense and casualties the highest at Omaha and Juneau beaches. Omaha was six miles wide and the largest of the landing areas. The Americans had been assigned to attack there. The men who managed to reach the sandy shore of Normandy faced withering fire from above. More than 2,400 of them died or were wounded. They were cut down in their prime. More than 60 years later, Shirley and I and our daughter Danae stood on the cliffs overlooking the landing site and tried to imagine what it must have been like to run exposed across that beach in the face of murderous machine gun fire and mortars. Every step could have been on a landmine hidden in the sand. Fellow soldiers with whom they had trained were falling on every side. Shirley, Danae, and I then moved to the Normandy American Cemetery, where the bodies of several thousand heroes lie buried beneath white crosses today. It was an unforgettable moment for us. We walked among the graves and read the inscriptions on some of the markers. Every man buried there had a story to tell, known only to God. Some of the names were of 17-year-old boys, and we wondered how their parents heard the news of their terrible loss. I found one cross bearing the name of a man who died on May 8, 1945. That was the last day of the war with Germany. I assumed this man had been seriously wounded at Omaha, but never recovered. The experience was so overwhelming for me that I entered a little chapel at one end of the cemetery and covered my face with both hands. Shirley searched and found me on my knees. Danae and I were given an unprecedented honor at that point. We were allowed to take down the American flag at the cemetery as the sun was setting. Then the superintendent helped us fold the flag. D-Day was a turning point in the outcome of the Second World War. Young soldiers, aviators, and seamen were willing to risk their lives to preserve liberty. They fought tenaciously to save their loved ones and future generations from tyranny. We are all in their debt. I want to close my letter with the words of President Ronald Reagan, whom I loved like a father. I advised him during the last five years of his two terms in office. At one point, President Reagan flew to France and spoke at the 40th anniversary of D-Day, 1984. It was one of the most powerful speeches of his career. The tribute he read was written by one of my favorite writers, Peggy Noonan. President Reagan spoke that day from Point de Hoc, overlooking the cliffs where American rangers had climbed up ropes in the face of German soldiers who were firing down on them. Some of the soldiers who survived the bitter battle were sitting near the president as he addressed them personally. This is what he said. We're here to mark that day in history when the Allied armies joined in battle to reclaim this continent to liberty. For four long years, much of Europe had been under a terrible shadow. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out from the camps. Millions cried out for liberation. Europe was enslaved and the world prayed for its rescue. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. We stand on a lonely, windswept point 
on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago, at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn, on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and to take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here and they would be trained upon the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades. And the American Rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of those cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one Ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin to climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 men came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. Behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of those cliffs. And before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Point du Hoc. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end the war. Forty summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys, with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? What impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? We look at you and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief and loyalty and love. The men of Normandy had faith that what they were doing was right, faith that they fought for all humanity, faith that a just God would grant them mercy on this beachhead or on the next. It was the deep knowledge, and I pray God we have not lost it, that there is a profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. You were here to liberate, not to conquer, and so you and those others did not doubt your cause. You were right not to doubt. You all knew that some things are worth dying for. One's country is worth dying for. And democracy is worth dying for because it's the most deeply honorable form of government ever devised by man. All of you loved liberty. All of you were willing to fight tyranny. And you knew the people of your countries were behind you. Something else helped the men of D-Day. Their rock-hard belief that providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here that God was an ally in this great cause. And so, the night before the invasion, when Colonel Wolverton asked his parachute troops to kneel with him in prayer, he told them, do not bow your heads, but look up so you can see God and ask his blessing in what we're about to do. Also that night, General Matthew Ridgway, on his cot, listened in the darkness for the promise God made to Joshua, quote, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee, Deuteronomy 31, 6. These are the things that impelled them. These are the things that shaped the unity of the allies. Strengthened by their courage and heartened by their valor 
and borne by their memory, let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they lived and died. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. President Ronald Reagan. I hope my recounting of this battle will help you capture the significance and the passion of this historic event. It's very dear to my heart. I was a little boy when it happened, and I grew up hearing about this moment in time. If I had been 10 years older, I could have been on one of those landings. Let me leave you with this suggestion. Read this letter to your children or ask them to read it for themselves. I'm afraid that today's school curricula doesn't teach much about American history or its heroes. We must not forget the sacrifices they made on our behalf. God bless America, land of the free, and home of the brave. This is James Dobson with Family Talk. If you were touched by this message, let us hear from you. We really would appreciate you dropping us a line. As we close, I want you to hear a fitting rendition of God Bless the USA. It was written by Lee Greenwood and sung by the wonderful trio, the Texas Tenors. If tomorrow all the things were gone I worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause this flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. Where there's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. One of my heroes is General Douglas MacArthur, who was one of the greatest military leaders of all times. He led the Allied armies through the darkest days of World War II and then on to victory over the Imperial Japanese Army. And then, of course, he went on to assume leadership over the Allied armies in Korea. His surprise landing of troops at Incheon was one of the most brilliant military maneuvers in the history of warfare. These accomplishments on the battlefield explain why MacArthur is revered today, more than three decades after his death. 
But there's another reason for my admiration of this man. It can be understood from a speech he gave in 1942 after he'd been selected for an award for being a good father. This is what he said on that day. Nothing has touched me more deeply than the act of the National Father's Day Committee. By profession, I'm a soldier, and I take great pride in that fact. But I'm prouder, infinitely prouder, to be a father. A soldier destroys in order to build. The father only builds, never destroys. The one has the potentialities of death. The other embodies creation and life. And while the hordes of death are mighty, the battalions of life are mightier still. It is my hope that my son, when I'm gone, will remember me not from the battle, but in the home. Those were the words of a great man. Thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825.